Pastor Truman, for 38 years, has answered the call to be a fisher of men. Every sermon is an anointed invitation to accept the gift of salvation through Jesus. No matter what it takes or where he's called, the pastor does whatever is needed to be a fisher of men. Now, this is Wings of Eagles Ministries with God's anointed pastor, Brother Truman, the fisherman. I want to welcome everybody to Sunday morning, uh, Wings of Eagles Ministry. Glad you're here. If you're a regular, we're really glad you're here because you stay with us, and this is your church. So we're we're happy that you be you called Wings of Eagles Ministry as your church. And if any others that come on, we welcome you to the Word of God that you would have a better understanding of what God is through Jesus Christ as he lives in our life. Amen. We're going to start off with Doyle, Brother uh, Reverend Doyle Davis with Let It Rain. So I hope you enjoy that. And we'll be right back. <laughs> Enjoyed the singing by Reverend Doyle Davis. Uh, today we're going to be covering the reality of the good, the good church and the bad church. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 7. And we will begin our study. We'll, we'll try to make it a study today. We'll not try to get into any preaching if I can. 
So if you're there, we're going to talk about the church of Jesus Christ, how we come into the body of Christ, how we understand it, how we deal with it, how the reality of, I guess, a good church or a bad church, or a good house of God or a bad house of God, pertaining to how you perceive it in your own mind and how you accept that because we coming to the house of God knowing it doesn't matter uh, how how the house is the sanctuary as long as uh, it suits your to your benefit of worshiping the Lord through Jesus Christ as he is uh, ministers to you I know a lot of people have their own altars set up in their houses and they uh, they do their morning prayers and stuff in front of the altar. Uh, that's good. It, it all pertains on individual, how they want to do it. And I know a lot of the shakers, they, they have altars set up with their bells and stuff in their house. But uh, uh, normally uh, a Christian person will not have that, but they'll have uh, their prayer closet where they go and, and uh, do the ministering or, or getting ministered from the Lord. So it's very important that you pick your place no matter where it is, besides your bed, in your living room, we're driving in your car, but to do things to, uh, to your benefit of how your relationship is with Jesus Christ. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit about how you are when you come in to be with the Lord or I, uh, I guess if you're seasoned, that's fine too, but picking the right place of, of worship and enjoying the presence of the Lord to what He has for you in your relationship with Him. And uh, chapter 7, you know, uh, Proverbs is all about uh, correction to the body, to individuals, so we understand that Proverbs is very important to establish in our ourself or our, our relationship with the Lord to deal with each circumstance and understanding how we uh, perceive it towards who He is, I guess. And I think that uh, chapter 7, I've heard a lot of ministers preach on this and they preach about the sins of the individual chasing the harlot and uh, committing adultery and all that, but they never really get a real focus on what Solomon is talking about. He, I, I think he wrote this to the experience of all the wives that he had. Uh, we know he had several hundred wives, so he must know something about the relationship with the, with the woman and how he got there. So I, I think he's very educated toward that. When he, when he wrote this, he was talking about a young person entering into the street or the path of righteousness towards who God is through Jesus Christ as he works in your life to, to become that how you pertain to the woman that calls your name or, or wants to uh, entice you into their place. It's very, um, I think it's important in our ministry or in standing with the Lord that we understand the fullness of what it isn't the type of church you have or you've entered in or the beauty of that church uh, a lot of churches are very beautiful and a lot of churches are <clears throat> uh, very humble <clears throat> excuse me so we need to look at where, where you meet with God do you meet him in the surroundings of a, a beautiful gold trim and, and uh, all this beautiful attire in the church or do you come to him in the humbleness of your heart to the reality of it doesn't matter where the sanctuary is or what it looks like on the outside it's still the house of God. I remember when I preached in uh, Oakville one year at Sister Marie Bird's church that I asked the people what they rather be in a, a beautiful church in the presence of that atmosphere of that church or would they be satisfied just being in a, a regular church, a humble church 
and uh, several of them picked they would like a, a beautiful church to attend but then I think of that as uh, when I was a practicing Catholic uh, when we went to mass it was, it was very formal and I, I appreciated the things we did and how the the plates and the cups were gold when they did the, the communion and stuff and everything was very uh, beautiful to the eye and uh, all the figurines that were all the way around the sanctuary were very beautiful to look at the seven stages of the cross and, and all these things were and the church was beautiful but when I began to, when I got saved in a Pentecostal, you know, a, a Protestant, uh, it was totally different for me because I didn't have that kind of church to attend. I had uh, the little old red church in Tahola and Brother Mike's church uh, up on the main drag. And it, uh, we had church. I mean, you didn't go there because of the, the beauty of the church, you went there because of the presence of the Lord. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. It isn't about the house of God, but it is about the Spirit of the Lord in that house. So we want to really look at that. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to, to uh, Proverbs 7, I'm sorry, and get ready and we'll, I'm just trying to pull it up here on my on my computer so if anybody talks to me okay I'm, I'm up so if anybody is there we'll we'll be in Jerry and Linda glad to have you E glad you're here you're you're one of my regulars so you and your mom oh it came on Okay, so um, we have a lot of people that come up on, on my computer, so I know that they don't watch it when it's live. Uh, 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 Becky and her, her family, and we, we want to keep everyone in prayer. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of things happening in our lives today that we, it requires a lot of prayer. So if you have, and if you put up a prayer request on my page, uh, if I don't read it off, don't don't think I forgot you because we'll go, I'll go over it and we will pray for the, your needs and as you keep me in prayer, we we'll, we'll keep you in prayer. So I want to welcome everybody once more for being with the program. And if you're a a, a, a late viewer, I know that your data is usually not there till later, and, and several people from Montana, Idaho. Are, and Oklahoma are not really on at the same time, but I welcome you in Arizona. And uh, so we we want to just be uh, open to everything that goes on in, in our ministry, Wings of Eagles ministry. So we, we want to be a, an open ministry to the people we want. To. Wings of Eagles ministry, we stand for the fullness and uh, righteousness of what Jesus Christ is. One of these days I'll bring my tenets of faith and I'll read them to you. They're usually pretty close to most uh, denominations, but my constitution bylaws may be a little different, but we still operate under the ministry as a church and as a ministry. So we welcome you, and if you want to belong to this ministry, praise God, you're, you're more than welcome to join us and say that we, we're your church, and I got no dispute over that. I'll take as many as I can get on a congregation to the, the webpage. So, understand that so amen proverbs chapter 7 i'm going to read a while then i may exhort on it i'm, I'm not sure how i'm going to go about it yet so we're all in the, up in the air about it so uh, we want to talk about uh, my bible says the Solomon persuades to the sinner's familiar, familiarity with wisdom, cunning, and, and lewd women. Uh, 
And like I said, when we started, a lot, a lot of people preach about uh, women in, in general, uh, about being a harlot and an uh, adulteress and, and taking that as, a, as face value. It is face value, I want to tell you that, but I'm going to go beyond that and express to you what the Bible says to me. So, my son, verse 1, chapter 7, Proverbs, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. Keep the laws, what he's saying, and my law as the apple of the eye. Make it very personal and real to you. Uh, verse 3, bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the tablets of thy heart. Keep them, uh, when they speak of tablets, it means when it's etched in there, it's, it's not going to be erased. And uh, w when you you do things, it, it is it, it is printed in, when they say it's printed in stone, then, then it's written and it'll never change. But we, we need to understand the fullness of, of who we are. Uh, you need to always understand the Lord never leaves you you leave him and uh, because uh, God the Father gave his son for the whole world not just individuals that are in the world for the whole world he gave his only begotten son that whoever so believeth on him shall have lasting life and I know a, a lot of us we can't get into the house of God and I know because of health reasons and, and everything else but it is, it is a good thing that you listen to the Word and understand the Word, read your Bible, uh, not all the time. I, I, you know, uh, there's, we can debate about that. Do you read the Bible every day or do you need it just when you need or do you read it when you need it? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I've read the Bible from front to back several times, probably five times, uh, but when I go in, I read certain chapters that are, are very beneficial to me at any particular time. So I, I, when I was pastoring, my studying of the Word was more extreme because I had to deal with the, the, the fullness of the people every day of my ministry 24-7. So I, I studied the Word of God to, to give me the wisdom and knowledge what I needed to feed the people in their need. So, but now that I'm just doing a weekly thing, I may falter a little, or I guess I can say a whole lot, but I have enough uh, in me, I'm hoping that, uh, I, I've said it always before, if there's nothing in your heart and mind, then Jesus can't use that. So if you have that word in you, then he can use it. So it doesn't matter how or when, but as long as you have that word, amen? So let us go on. Verse 4. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. She is related to you. Call understanding my kinswoman. Be, be, have a relationship with the wisdom and understand that the fullness of that which God has given us through the wisdom that we have in ourselves to understand the fullness of what God is speaking to us at any particular time. That's why we're looking at the depth of this word, not the face value. Don't don't think about the face value when I read. Just think about what I'm going to talk about. So, verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman. Underline that if you have your Bible. From the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the windows of my house I looked through my casement, and behold, among the simple ones, uh, we're talking about the young in Christ, the the young people that are no matter your age, but if you're if you're you're young in the Lord, you're not seasoned into the word and all that. That's what he's talking about. And I discern among the use of young men, void of understanding, don't understand the Word of God. And that's uh, really important. I'll always teach you 
that there is face value in the Word of God, but if you study and, and prove yourself to the fullness of that wisdom and knowledge that He gives you through fasting and prayer and seeking the Lord, you'll always understand the depth of that Word and what it means to you as an individual and how you can use that Word for your benefit to, to uh, make it through this life that we live. Amen. So, I behold, I'm out simple and discern of youth and young of, and a young, verse 7, a young man void of understanding, doesn't understand the word, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way of her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart, subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Oh, we won't get into that. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is with the. Now is she without? Verse 12. Now in the streets and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him. And with a imprudent face, said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore come. I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. And I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works and fine linen of Egypt. I'm going to stop there. Now, <clears throat> we talked about this earlier, Alex and I. Uh, the the woman, the harlot, standing on the corner of the street is the, the reality, a house of God, a church. The church is always called the woman. The, the woman is always the church or it is Israel. So right here we're dealing with the house of God. And we look at, I can go in this community in Grace Harbor, uh, we can look at a lot of churches. They're all different in, in stature. They're, they're all look different. They're all made different. And if you enter into any of the, the sanctuaries around Aberdeen, you're going to see the, the beauty of that church. You're going to see the humbleness of that church. And I say humbleness because it doesn't have uh, the gold plating or the tapestries hanging on the wall and the, the gold things up at the altar uh, like the... Uh, what, what am I trying to say? Uh, I grew up Catholic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I understand what the the house of God there looked like. To me, it was very beautiful because uh, Catholics go to the extreme. May, may, may I say that without any condemnation? But uh, so does the, a lot of church, the Lutheran, the... Uh, to go to downtown uh, but we used to the priest down there or whatever he was called talk with me and <clears throat> it, they had a beautiful church uh, I'm trying to remember what kind of church it was but uh, it was very beautiful they, they left their doors unlocked well they actually they did lock them but at night but uh, but he gave me a key to the church, told me it was all mine, I could use it any time I want, any room, any, and we did, and, and uh, it was very uh, elaborate. The candles, the, the, the bowl that held the water for the baptizing, and, and everything at the altar there, their pulpit was beautiful, but when I ministered there, I took the, the little book thing and took it down off of the platform and I used that to preach. I never stood behind their pulpit because they always had the, the big Bible on that pulpit and I guess they preached from that, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but I, I, I used the, the little pedestal. So I, but, but what I'm saying is a lot of people, they desire that and remember at the beginning, I said, I, I asked people, would they rather be in a beautiful church or a little humble church? And a lot of them chose uh, to be in a beautiful church. 
But the beauty of that church doesn't present the beauty of what God is to you spiritually as an individual in your heart and in your mind. You go into church for the beauty of it, you think it expresses the Lord. It doesn't express the Lord. What was the Lord as he walked this earth? They said he was a poor, poor man. He was a carpenter's son. So we have to focus on that and understand the reality of that to the extent how he is perceived by us. Did he come? You read in the Bible, how did he come to Abraham? Abraham was a traveling man. He was a wayfaring man. He traveled and traveled. How did the Lord come to him? He came to him as a journeyman walking in the desert. Came to him, to him. He was just a regular person that was just walking in, in the desert. Didn't have a place to lay his head, but he came to him as a wayfaring man. So you have to understand that. How did he come to Joshua? He come as a uh, the captain of the host of God with the sword in his hand. Why? Because Joshua was a warring man. So he seen that in who he was and what Christ came to him. So we got to understand the fullness of what we deal and how we see the fullness of that. Remember when, uh, I'm trying to remember who else he came to. Who did he come to? Uh, who wrestled with the angel? He seen him as a man, a traveling man. The angel wrestled with him. You remember, I think it was Jacob that he wrestled with until the breaking of day. But he, but he held on to that. The Bible says he wrestled with the man. But the reality is he was wrestling with the Lord in prayer and supplication. But in the face value of that, he was wrestling with the man, which was an angel of God, through, through the reality of what he was trying to to perceive because Esau, when he said, J Jacob sent his family, he knew that Esau was coming with uh, several hundred soldiers coming towards him. And you know, they did not l separate on, on good terms. So he was a little afraid of coming back and meeting Esau because Esau was a warring man. And he had a lot of uh, things that came to him to the battles he fought. So we understand. So. So Jesus is going to come to you in the, the need that you have at that particular time. So you're going to understand that. You're going to see that. I don't know if I, am I chasing the rabbit here? I'm not sure. But let us catch this rabbit. Because when you, when you enter into the house of God, it isn't the, the beauty of the house, but it is the beauty of how God reaches you through Jesus Christ in the spirituality of who you are. You're not going to, you're not going to be the fullness of what you are. You, uh, uh, years ago, there weren't that many churches, so a lot of people, the, the world, the mountains or whatever, was a sanctuary that they traveled to, to travel up the mountain to be in a day of prayer, to, to meet, wherever you meet with the Lord, that is your sanctuary and how you deal with that. So the reality of, uh, uh, we were just talking about this morning, when uh, years ago, when I went to the Wilderness Church, we, I, I drove up and down that road looking for the wilderness. I was on the right road, but I couldn't find a church. This mind was looking for a church, but I didn't see it. But I, I, we seen these Indian guys standing around, so we stopped and asked them where the wilderness church was, and they said it was right here. It was a humble little house, a white house. I had uh, a little, little pews in it and a, a little platform, a pot belly stove, and but. The power of God, I remember when Brother Leroy was preaching there, I'm, I'm not sure if he pastored that church or not, I, I think he did, uh, but uh, the, the movement of God was tremendous at that time, and you didn't, you didn't care about what the place looked like, you cared about how Jesus was ministering to your heart and your soul at any particular time, and you conformed to that. The beauty of the church didn't matter. I think all the worst buildings that you see, are probably the best buildings, or the best sanctuaries that ever was. Let's look at Azusa Street. When they were in Los Angeles and they came to Azusa Street, what is that? That was an old warehouse. It used to be an old warehouse, run-down building. But the move of God was was there to an extreme that it lasted several, several hundred days, and and it, it never ended. I'm, I'm thinking it went for three years. I'm not real sure but it's been a long time since I studied Azusa Street, but 
we, you know, we're always looking for that Azusa Street experience at any particular place. I look for it constantly because no matter where I go, I'm looking for God to, to break out and people begin to dance, cry, weep, and whatever. But I do, I do want to see that. I, I want to be counted in that number, so to speak. So I want to understand the fullness of what God is doing at any particular time. But if he decides to pour out his spirit, like he did at Azusa Street, I want to be there. And the whole concept of Azusa Street, when I studied that and I preached that word, everybody, uh, everybody wanted to claim where it started. It started in Canada, and it moved across the ocean, and it started there, and some person brought it over here. But when I began to, to research that, there was one thing I understood in my own spirit, that you cannot go and get the anointing and bring it back. It may be on you, but you'll never, you'll never bottle it up or box it up and bring it back and give it to the people. It, it is given because God is a, is a spirit and we must what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. And when we know that, the Bible says it will set us free. And so we understand the fullness of that through the reality of what God is at any particular time. So we move in the abundance of that word and to an extreme. So the house of God, the sanctuary, doesn't have to be uh, all beautiful and, and uh, elaborate in what you are. It has to be where the Spirit of the Lord rests and how you deal with that into the reality of God. And I'm not sure how the uh, Episcopalian Church, I think, is the one we attended. And it's very beautiful, but I, I don't know how the Lord moved there. I'm not sure. I know they're pretty, uh, I think they're pretty legalistic in how they do things and what they do. And do they still wear the robes and the cap or the hats, the crowns on their head? So I'm not sure how, how to deal with that. And I know there's a lot of uh, Holy Ghost filled people from every denomination. You can't deny that. You can't say it all while well, that church is dead but there's always spirit-filled people in every denomination, no matter how you look at that and how you deal with that. So the fullness of what CCN is on there, good to see you, or good to see you on there. Jacob, yeah, Jacob. My daughter corrected me here. I figured that out after I started talking about it. So, but thank you. And, uh, I think that, <laughs> yeah, Jerry, yeah, that thing used to be so hot, you could almost see through it, that little stove in the wilderness church. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a good time when we were there. I, 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 did, I, I got, had a lot of good times there, but we, we used to travel all over because uh, the power of God was moving it almost everywhere at that time. And, uh, I know when we got saved, we had church here for, I don't know, a long time, over a year, I'm sure. But we had church all the time. And uh, everybody, no matter where you talked to them, and, and talk, they always knew where 1010 College was in Aberdeen. And they all came here. And uh, we never had, I never had the furniture I got now because when I tore this room out, all we had was a couch and a chair. Uh, but we moved chairs in, we had uh, benches, we had, but it was just like a church. We had, we had church and it was an exciting time. We had music, we had everything. So um, <clears throat> I understand the reality that sure, I would like to go and build a beautiful church. And Alex and I were talking about that yesterday. Was that yesterday? That she would like me to go back pastoring, but um, maybe, who knows? Uh, it depends on what the Lord has to say about it and how He wants to deal with it. But we went and looked at a, a few places where I'm sure you could call them very humble, but. Uh, we're not looking for beauty, we're looking for a place for the power of God to move. So it, it would be, again, I guess I, everybody calls me pastor, so I, I guess I never got away from that. 
in my ministry, so I'm still Pastor Truman Santiago, and everybody still calls me that. Uh, but I do, uh, if it's the right time and the Lord calls me to do that, then we'll step into that and do it all over again. I'm sure it will be a, a fantastic time for, for us to, to really step into that place of God to, for His people and to minister to them. So it is, a, it is what it is, so we'll just leave it at that. So don't, uh, let's leave it at that. <clears throat> so we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, Solomon is looking out his window in the casement. He sees the young man walking. He sees the harlots, but really he's seeing the church of God. We're talking about this morning, Alex and I, when I went to Spokane and you go into this one area and there's all kind of churches there. I don't know if there have to be zoned right or what, but when we went to the Pentecostal church, there was a church on every corner. So when I understand that, I understood what Solomon was talking about. There's a harlot on every corner, which are enticing the young people or the young in Christ or the none that the ones that aren't seasoned in what God has for them and enticing them with tapestries that says, my. My bed is covered with fine linen from Egypt. It has beautiful things that will bring a lot of people into that house. But the reality of what we're looking for is the move of God and the spirituality of who he is to us at any particular time to begin in that house. So it doesn't matter the appearance of the place. It matters that the spirit of the Lord that moves in that place. So. It, does, it doesn't matter if we're at a house, we're at a big church, we're at a little humble church. It doesn't matter. It, it deals with the reality of where Jesus or where you meet with him. And I think that uh, the, little, the little churches, I think they're very important because the, uh, the, the beauty of a person, <clears throat> excuse me, and the reality of what? Christ is working in our lives, it isn't our outward appearance, it's our inward appearance. You know, we work on the outside, Jesus works on the inside. So we, we deal with that to the reality of what Jesus is to me. Sure, I want to look good and I want to I want to be able to present. I'm a minister. And to me, if I believe this. 40 years, when I first started serving the Lord, that got to be 40 years ago by now. But I believed if you were a minister, then praise God, you should look like a minister. So I, I wear a suit when I minister. I wear a sports jacket. I wear a vest. I wear a tie or, or, or what I want to present myself as that. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people talk about Jesus in his ministry. He was poor. Yeah, he was carpenter's son. And he, he walked around, but you gotta always remember what the word says. People recognized him by who he was. So he had to have something on that represented who he was. He wore a priestly robe because it said it was colorful. It had a hem on the gar uh, the garment had a hem on it. And the, the ministers always wore a certain type of robe and if you look at the pictures of Jesus Christ, they always detect him wearing that particular robe. So do the recognition of who he, who he was and who he was to them was very notable for them to see. So the reality, if he is gonna to minister to the people, how did they follow him? How did they recognize him? How did they come to him? Because of his appearance, who he was. How did uh, John, the Baptist, or Bap John the Baptist recognize him? When Jesus came, he knew who he was. He knew that he was the, the forerunner of Christ. When, when Jesus walked into that place and he asked John to baptize him, what did John say? I am, I am not worthy to un, unlatch your sandals and take them off your feet. And what did Jesus tell him? Let it be so. Baptize me that it may fulfill the word of God. So the reality is, he, re he recognized Jesus. Oh, they were first cousins, probably. Well, they were first cousins. But the reality, we need to understand the fullness of who, who we look at. So church, it does not matter what the church looks like. 
sure, a lot of people want to go there. They want to say, wow, I go to this church because it's a beautiful church. But if we're going to re present ourselves into the reality of what that is, so we can do it for self in the spite of other people as they look at us to, to, for them to recognize who we are and because where we go and worship the Lord, we're doing it for the wrong thing. Uh, let me read a scripture for you. And, and, I, and I, I, we don't have this on, on focus, but I'm gonna read this. I, I, I think it's, it's very important. I wanna look at this scripture. Um, we're gonna go to Romans 8. I'm going to read, I'm going to just read <clears throat> probably 13 chapter, 13 verses, verse 1, Romans 8, 1. This is about the spirituality of an individual. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation in them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, what it could not benefit me. Oh, we found it. Praise God. For the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh, in the flesh part of who we are because we are in a carnality of what we are and in weak through the flesh God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is his. And I'm going to stop it right there. Because we're talking about being in the house of God and who we are. We're, we're the, what did Jesus say? Where, where is the sanctuary? Where is the temple of God? And they, they, they be, begin to try to reason that. And what did Jesus say? The, it is within you as an individual. So where, where is the church and the reality of what Jesus is talking about? I, I am his sanctuary. I am the house of God to what he benefits me to the reality of who we are. And when we bring ourselves together in the spirituality of who we are, then we become one, one people, one voice, one mind, one heart. And when we reach that, we reach the fullness of what Jesus Christ is to us at any particular time in that and what we do. So is it about the church? Is it about the beauty of the church? No, it is about carnality and spirituality. If you're in the carnality of who you are, then you're probably going to want a beautiful church so people can look at you and say, oh, he goes to such a beautiful church and look how he dresses so nice and beautiful and look at the dresses she wears, so gorgeous and she's so beautiful in them. What about the homeless? Right? Well, we used to co-pastor downtown at the, the Faith House. People off the street, they didn't come in looking gorgeous and beautiful, but they came in because they wanted to listen to the Word of God, to who they were at, you know, at that particular time. And when I prayed for them, I didn't pray for good-looking people that were uh, nice and clean and smelled good. and. And, and, and wanted to express how they looked towards what God was. They came there for a need in the house of God to understand the fullness of what he could do in their life at that time and lay hands on them. And, 
It, you, have to, you have to be a part of them to be able to minister to them. Amen. So we, we look at that and we understand that. I, sure, I dress the part, but I'm, my suits don't cost no $5,000. They don't cost no $1,000. I buy mine from J.C. Penney's. Or, or my first my first sports jacket came from uh, uh, Olympia, the old Yardbirds, the, the old uh, uh, discount store. I think I bought it for $5. It was hanging on a, a get, get it out the door rack, you know, $5 red tag. I bought that. That's the only jacket I had to go to church, but I wanted to express myself and be that which God had called me to be, to be, if I was going to go to church, I wanted to look my best. You know, if the President of the United States came to your town and you went down to view him, would you go down there in your dirty work clothes and, and the reality of what you are? And you'd be talking, no, you would want to look good and go down there and see him and represent yourself towards him if he was coming to meet you. You wouldn't go and, and, and just anything. You would want to dress up. I have that mindset. If I'm going to go to the house of God, I'm going to dress accordingly to, to please Him, that I may look the best I can, no matter what I was wearing. I mean, my first jacket cost $5. i am sure Cece still got that old silver jacket, uh, a double-breasted jacket. I mean, I don't even like double-breasted jackets, but I had one. And uh, But the thing is, I, I bought it to make myself look better. I mean, a, a, a silver sports jacket with a black shirt and blue jeans and a pair of old beat up gray cowboy boots. I went to church, but that was the best I had. So I represent myself. And this is what, what the, uh, Solomon is talking about. When, when that person comes down that street and he sees the harlot standing on the corner enticing him, oh, come to our church. Hey, we got a beautiful church. We got tapestries, we got everything. But she's saying it according to her house. What? In the, it is, oh, where am I at here? Oh, where am I at? In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. When I first came to the Lord, they told me, never go out in the dark. You know, when did you have the best time when you were in the world? Was it in the daytime? No. And it was in the nighttime. And the closer it got to two o'clock, the more fun you had. And when you went out and you partied and had a good time, there was no daylight. It was in the dark. Why do we do things in the dark? Because it's comfortable. It's it's relaxing and nobody really knows who we are. They don't recognize us, maybe because we're out there in the world. But the reality, that's what it's saying, that we do it in a twilight, in a dark of the night because we don't have the fullness of the spirituality of who Jesus Christ is. So what I'm saying, my carnality, I never went to a party in the daytime. I always went to a party in the nighttime. That way you could kind of blend in with everybody, no matter how you look. You were there to have fun, drink beer, drink whiskey, whatever, and have a good time. So when you come into the house of the Lord, and let, let me add this, you didn't care where the party was. Could have been down at the beach, could have been at a little shack. But as long as you were having fun drinking beer, you had a good time. And the reality is, it should be the same in Christianity. When you become that spiritual being, it should not matter what the building looks like. It matters where you can be with Him. Amen? So let, let me let me finish this out. I got a couple more things I want <clears throat> to. She is loud and stubborn. Uh, we won't even talk about that because uh, I did that before. Every woman in the congregation gave me a mean look. So we don't we don't want to go there. So her feet abide not in her home. She's the fullness of who she thinks she is. She caught him, kissed him, gave him that comfort and embraced him to come into the house. You know, we were offered to go to a lot of places, a lot of churches, but we weren't after the beauty. I had, we had church in, in this Tenton College Road for a, a long time, and the reality, the, the presence of the Lord always met us here. You cannot uh, 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 bring God with you. You can bring the spirituality of who he is into that. I remember when... Uh, 
the the move and uh, what they call that move and uh, uh, somebody can tell me down in uh, um, Florida. The glad to have you here, Robbie. Been praying for you. I hope everything is doing well with you. Um, always got you in my thoughts. Always so don't don't ever forget that. It'll it will get better in time, but. Uh, as they say, time heals all problems. It's just a matter of time. So, Robbie, I'm still praying for you. Uh, I'm there. So, uh, nobody's going to tell me. Uh, I'm trying to think of that name of that place, but not real sure what it is. Uh, they called it something. One moment, please. Chris, I'm Laffelson. I'm glad you're on there. And I'm glad everybody's here. Praise God. Yes, important to me. So, where was I? I chased a rabbit in my own. I have peace offering with me this day. I have paid my vows. What did she? How did she pay her vows? She did all her things according to the house that she represented in herself as a church. She did the meal, she did the, the communion, she did all this, that's what it's talking about. She paid her vows and, and, and the, the reality of who she is. I have peace offering with me. I have this to, to give to you, to, to bring you into the fullness of who I am and what I am. Therefore, verse 15, therefore have I, I come I forth to meet the diligently to seek thy seek face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings and fine linen of Egypt. Verse 16, I'm going to go on to 17. I have perfumed my, my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us salute ourselves with loves, for the good man is not at home. Amen. Where is the good man? You know, uh, this is what I wanted to say when I go in. For, verse 19, for the good man is not at home. He is gone a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. What is she talking about? She's a, a married woman. Uh, a married woman, we're talking about the church. What is the church? It's married to who? Jesus Christ. And what does it say? He is gone on a long, he isn't here now. He's gone on a long trip. Because remember when the, I just read that the other night when they were standing on the road and Jesus went up in that cloud. I have a, a figurine of that in our vase over there when he was riding the cloud. And he went up to heaven and the angels were uh, standing there and he told the disciples, why do you stand here gazing upward? The same Jesus will come as he went. He will come in that cloud. Amen. So we understand. So he is gone. The church knows that he's gone. They're married to Christ. And the church is the body of Christ. So it is the bride of Christ. We are all the bride of Christ. So we have the understanding of the reality of that due to who we are and what we are. Amen. So married, fullness, but he's gone. He's not going to come home. He will and will come home at the day appointed. Nobody knows that day, not even Jesus knows that day. No, do we want to, a lot of people wrote books about that day, but they came and gone, and they, it never happened. So, but uh, we have to rely on knowing that he is coming, amen? So let me, let me finish this out, because I got another, a couple of scriptures I want to read to you. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. 22, he goeth after her straightway as an ox, goeth to the slaughter as a fool to the correction of the stalks. Tell a dart, strike through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. <clears throat> 24, hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thy heart decline of her ways, go not astray in her path. <clears throat> for she has cast down, cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down 
to the chambers of death. Uh, many people have attended the Lord's house uh, over the years, but they uh, begin to backslide and they become that person what we're talking about here because she leads them astray. There's a lot of places you can go. I always tell people, <clears throat> if you're going to have a ministry come in and minister at your whatever you have, always know their doctrine. You know, when I pastored a church and I had ministers, evangelists call me up, want to come to the church, I didn't say, sure, my doors are open, come on in. Nope, I asked them for a tape. I say, send me a tape, I'll listen to your word, and you, if I like it, you're, you're doing the same as I am, then you can come to my church and preach to my people. Because I've done it the other way. A person wanted to come, <clears throat> I had him come. But when he got done preaching, he had my congregation going in a whole nother direction. And I wasn't good for what I was establishing in them. So I understand if I want somebody to preach for me, I want to know their doctor. I want to know how they believe. There's a few things that I don't believe as a lot of Protestant or denominations believe, but I stand on my word, but I don't go around browbeating anybody to, uh, to hey, believe my way or the highway. But I, I, I want to preach the love and uh, the Word of God. So I want to do it in love, not not uh, condemnation. And uh, I don't like to preach, uh, uh, what I say, brimstone and fire. I don't want to preach that because I want to preach the love of Jesus Christ because that what he says, that we have to do it in love and compassion that he has for individuals. Amen? So don't be a fool. Don't be led astray as the oxen go into slaughter. You know, uh, when an animal goes to slaughter, he don't know the outcome. He will be the normal. A sheep never knows what you're going to do to him. Uh, uh, a cow never knows he's walking into death. He'll, you can lead him anywhere you want until that time comes and you you destroy him or slaughter him or whatever, however you want to call it. He don't know any difference, and that's what he's talking about. Don't be like that. Don't, don't be enticed by good and beautiful things. Be enticed by the Word of God through Jesus Christ as he works in your life. I want to read another scripture. Uh, oh, let me, let me say this. Uh, put on the whole armor of God because he, he's talking about the dark that pierces us, the, the things that are... are go bump in the night, the things that bother us and the reality of who we are. He said, put on the whole armor of God. Put on, I, I, I'm going to read that to you, but I want to read this first. Can I read this first? Let me throw my glasses on. Then we're going to finish this out. I want to go to 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 13.11, I think. 13.11, uh, 1 Corinthians. What am I doing here? Uh, 11, 10, 1 Corinthians, thir oh, 13, did I say 13? 13, 11, amen, 13, 11. Let me read the whole chapter because it's really beneficial to us. Do I speak with the, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And... What what uh, Paul is voicing here, you can have all these things and you can do them, and they don't mean a, a darn thing unless you have the love of Jesus Christ in you. That's what he's talking about. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and not and have not charity, it glorifies me nothing. It don't mean nothing without the love 
that I'm supposed to have. Amen. So, charity suffers long. This is what love does. I want you to understand, you can, love don't kill. Charity suffers long and is kind. Love is kind. Charity envies not. It don't want nothing else but love. Charity vaulteth not itself, is not puffed up. It is not a pride. If you have love, you can't be a prideful person and say you have the love of Jesus Christ. Doeth not behave itself unseemly. It, it doesn't go off its track. Charity envieth not. Charity vaulteth not itself, and not puffed up. Do not believe itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. You cannot provoke love thinking no evil. You know, a mother can love a child, and that child could be the worst in the whole neighborhood, but the love of that mother is never going to falter in who that child is. That's what it's talking about. Love will never decline. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopes all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophetics or prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, this is very important, this is what I will, I said all this to say this. But when, oh, for we know in part, verse 9, we prophesy in part. We're only going to say what we see and what we understand. But when that which is perfect is come, talking about Jesus Christ, when that person comes, then that which is in part shall be done away, which I know in part I'm speaking. I don't know the fullness of that love that he has, but I do know that it's very great. So this is what Paul is talking about. I'm only operating in part. I'm not operating in the fullness of that love that he has. When... Verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, but, and I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I transformed myself to that, that's why young Christians are very zealous. I was zealous. We, we do things without thinking. We did things without thinking, but when we put that childhood away, and became the reality of what Jesus Christ was to that sanctuary of that church or that house of God. We understood. We changed our ways. The whole uh, program changed. Amen. So let me read on. For now we through, see through a glass darkly. You hold a glass up. You look at it. You cannot see clearly to the other side is what he's saying. But then face to face. When Jesus comes, it's going to be face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I'm going to know him as he knows me. That's what he's talking about. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of three of these three is love, charity. Amen. I want to read one more scripture, then I'm going to, we're going to close this out. Okay. I want to go to... Ephesians, which way is Ephesians? I want to go to Ephesians 6 6. I'm going to finish with this. Then we're going to hear another song by Brother Johnny Curtis. But let me read this. I want to I want to I want you to understand it. Putting on the whole armor of God. Uh, <clears throat> verse 6 not with eye service as men pleasers don't do things to please men but to please God but as a servant of Christ doing the will of God from the heart from the heart with good well doing service as the Lord and not to men do it because you don't want to be a man pleaser you want to be a God pleaser a Christ pleaser knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth the same shall be, shall he receive of the Lord. Whatever you do for anybody else, you're going to get it back sevenfold. Whether it be bond or free, whether you're in 
bonds of your free. And ye masters do the same things unto them. I'm going to bury, and I'm going to go to verse 10. This is my whole, this is my whole concept here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand in a day of evil or against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers and darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand an evil day, having done all, having done all to stand. You will never stand with one part. You have to have all of them. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. Know the truth. The Bible says, know the truth, and the truth shall what? set you free. And having the breastplate of righteousness, having that protection over the heart, is what it's talking about, to shield this what the righteousness of who God is and uh, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You, you walk in the fullness of, of that which God has given you through Jesus Christ his son. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith, you cannot, um, you can believe in who Jesus is but you cannot enter into his place of resting unless you have faith in him and who he is. So uh, belief will get you to the door, but faith will unlock that door into the reality of God's uh, abode or wherever he lives. So wherever you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy, remember the dart that pierces the liver and uh, Alex and I talked about this. The liver is a purification of the whole body. It purifies. So that's what the enemy is after. It's after to, to rot thy soul to the fullness of that which blood goes around to, to carry. Um, I don't know. When we were kids, we used to watch this. Uh, um, we watched this video about the blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and what their job was. And the black, the black ones that came in to destroy but the white ones had the ability to purify the blood and to go, and it represented the whole body. It's pretty exciting when I was a kid, but I understand it to the fullness now. So let me let me finish this. Shield of faith. Shield of faith, you're able to move it. It's that you're able to move it all the way around you, and it and it, uh, it, it blocks everything that comes to you because you have the faith into the fullness. It shall be able to quench all the fairy darts and take the helmet of salvation and a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer, supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto the perforations of the supplications for all spirits, knowing the house where you go to worship the Lord, to fulfill the fullness of what that is to you in any concept that you have and to the reality of who it is. I want to thank everyone for being with us, Robbie, and E, and your mom, I'm sure, CC, Jerry and Linda, uh, Becky, I'm sure, will be on there later, Edetta, and uh, John, who, all of you, I, I appreciate you joining us and belonging to Winds of Eagles ministry. We're going to finish this out. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, uh, Rayola is in a, I don't know if she got out of the hospital, she never texted me and told me she was out of the hospital, but she was battling covert. So keep uh, my friends in prayer. And uh, so we deal with the reality of what God is and, and the fullness of what we are. Let me see who all's on here. Emmett, Robbie, Lori Wilson, uh, amen. I'm glad you're here. Deb, Deb. My cousin, I hope you're feeling better. Prayed for you when I seen your post on Facebook. Roger, Adam, Dove White, praise God. Well, I hope you're doing fine. I haven't seen you in years. And Chris Raffleson and Jackie, my uh, friend's sister, Jackie. I haven't seen her and don't even, I can't even say how long I haven't seen her. Uh, but welcome, welcome to the program. Glad you're all here. And we want to close out with Brother Johnny Curtis.
singing some praise and worship. And join us next week. We'll continue on in the Word of God and how it can be beneficial to us. So I hope you enjoy uh, Brother Johnny Curtis as he sings some praise and worship. Amen. So thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Amen. Pastor Truman would love to hear from you. Email Native Prayer Warriors at gmail.com. That's Native Prayer Warriors at gmail.com. Or mail to Wings of Eagles Ministries, 1010 Coolidge Road, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520. And remember, God through His Son has made you perfect in His sight.